Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for the folks that are here. Thank you so much for their voices in song and praises and anthems to you, Lord. Because that's what it's all about, getting the, getting the hearts and the ears open for the message that is going to be presented today. Thank you so much for that, Lord. And thank you for the opportunity for us to be up here and sing your praises and lead folks in those efforts. We love you, Lord, more than you can ever know. But you know everything, so you probably know how much we love you. Thank you, God, for being here and thank you, touch each and every one of us today. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, set us up. We got a little song. She wants to sing You Are My Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> well. I told her when we were done we could sing it and she thinks we're done. Oh, we're not. Oh, well, when we're done, okay, that's a deal, right? Okay. Anyway, let's give thanks to the Lord. Uh, actually, shouldn't it be come to the river? Oh, the I'm, river. I'm singing the wrong song. Yeah. Let's give thanks to the Lord and come to the river. That How about river. that? <laughs> <laughs> okay.
come to the river, get some baptisms done. There's been a few folks in here this last year, not this year, last year that got washed in the blood, and it's so good. In fact, we're going to give thanks for that. She thinks we're done again. every day, every minute, every meal. Give thanks to the Lord and his amazing grace that he gives us for free. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to work for it. It's a free gift from our Lord. And all you need is just a little tiny mustard seed of faith. And he'll give you that grace. It's an awesome thing, amazing grace. I'll get in the right key, and we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Please, sing out with the top of your voice. We, we need all the help we can get up here, and it would be yes, really nice we if we could hear you.
so much. Pastor Larry, I know you're out there somewhere. Kids. <laughs> the kids can head back to their classes. Yes. We're going to sing at the end. Looky there, folks. I found me a new hat. Well, life's got, full of disappointments, isn't it? I got the magic button here. Now you're on. Is this thing on? Yep, I believe it is, isn't it? Yep. All right. Well, it, you know, out there from where I was sitting, it sounds like heaven when you folks sing. Thank you so much for 
for being here. If you're here uh, visiting with us this morning, uh, just rest easy. You're, you're not going to be asked to do a, a thing except just be among us. And for long, you won't be a stranger. You'll be a friend just like everybody else is. We thank God for each one here. Not a one of us could do without the rest of us. We're grateful. Would you join me in prayer as we begin? Lord, we're thankful that we can open up your Bible and take a look at it together. We're thankful for amazing grace too, Lord. We, uh, we're thankful that we don't have to earn your forgiveness. That no matter what we have done, no matter what we do, uh, we don't have to earn forgiveness from you. You give it to us because you love us. And really the only requirement is that we sincerely ask you and, and then try to fall in behind you and trail along the best we're able. And thank you, Lord, that you promise that you'll come back and pick us up when we wander off somewhere. You won't forget us. We can be that one little lost sheep and you'll come find us again. Now, Lord, I'm standing here to open up the book, the Bible, and, and to share some things. You and I talked over all week, and I asked you for help, and you've never failed us yet. I'm grateful, Lord, that I don't have to stand here on my own. Please, Lord, help me to uh, lean heavy on you. So grateful that you're close by and you're taking care of us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you just didn't have enough, enough faith? Maybe the situation seemed bigger than, than your faith. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, I, I hope it'll be of some comfort to all of you that are just like me. I believe that'd be everybody here. I want to read you something that nobody knows who wrote this, but I like it. It's called One Solitary Life. You may well have heard it before. He was born in an obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He then became an itinerant preacher. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He had no credentials but himself. Nineteen centuries have come and gone. And today, he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. We're going to talk today about a fellow, I'll introduce you to him in a minute, who went looking for Jesus, saying, I believe, help my unbelief. You ever been there? Maybe you're there today. Maybe some days all of us are there. One thing that's good about, first of all, what the Bible has to say and good about this church is you don't have to show off here. The Bible doesn't require us to do anything except have just a little bit of faith. My old buddy Jerry talked about a mustard seed, and that's all it takes. We're going to talk about that today. Come along with me. We're standing over here on the side of a hill. That's so we can see the goings on. A good sized crowd has gathered. They've heard that Jesus is in the neighborhood. 
We're not part of the crowd. We're just kind of looking on down through the centuries. Oh, there's a good bit of excitement. Everybody's all bunched up. They want to take a look at this now famous traveling preacher. But he's not here yet. You see, every place he goes these days, a crowd gathers up and the religious bigwigs, the scribes and the Pharisees, they hate him. They despise the very sight of him. But that's okay because truth is, most of the crowd hates them. They've earned it. They're the kind of folks you wouldn't want to hang with. The sad truth, though, is that there's no love lost in these days as we look at this crowd of folks. There's a lot of discontent, a lot of anger. Israel, their nation, has become a slave state. The Romans rule with an iron hand. They tax to the point of misery for the people. And a small number of people, not very many, have been following Jesus, not just tagging along, but really following and listening and trying to learn. And they're hoping, this little bunch, and they're wondering, could this be the Messiah? Could this man be the savior of our nation? Could he be the fulfillment of the old prophet's predictions? And they're wondering, but nobody really is sure. Well, Jesus has been away from his disciples. We're not sure for how long. You see, he took... Peter, James, and John, and he went up on the side of a mountain. And uh, we'll talk about that next week, I believe. Explain to you what was going on up there. It's a miracle that he needed them to see and that needed to happen. But for this week, let's go to Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 16. Jesus has come back. And we'll read, when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed. And running to him, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Meaning the the disciples. Disciple means learner, by the way, learner and follower. We can see that Mark's correct when he writes, the crowd of people are amazed. You see that, you look back, research that a little bit, it means excited. They get to see this famous rabbi who heals misery with miracles. How would you like to be there? Wouldn't you be excited to see Jesus? One day you will. I hope you're excited. It comes down to a choice, really, folks. We can see him with excitement or we can see him with fear. We'll talk about that some more another time. Well, Jesus speaks to the religious leaders. He asks these proud, arrogant scribes, what are you saying to these men who travel with me? These few that are eager to learn. Matthew chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. Doesn't say the scribes have anything to say. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth and he gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out and they could not. 
Well, Mark doesn't tell us what, if anything, the scribes have to say to Jesus. <laughs> I think that's because they're not important. They have nothing to do with this story that matters, so they get left out. Now, looking on as, as we are, we're surprised to see this man step between these rulers of the people, these religious big shots, step between them and Jesus. But you're looking at a man who's in desperate need of help. This is his boy. Imagine it's one of your children or your brother or your sister. And the misery has gone on and on and on. And, and there's a glimmer of hope that maybe you can get some help today. And you have just a little bit of faith that something might be done. Well, these religious big shots have the power if they want to use it to, to destroy this man and his family. One word from them, and he's thrown out of his synagogue, that's their church, and he is blacklisted in the community, and he has nowhere to turn. And it can't be fixed if they choose to do it. That'll show you maybe a little bit about how desperate he is to try to get some help. And it's a, that moment when he says to Jesus, I asked your scribes to help. I'm sorry, your disciples to help. And they've tried, but they failed. You know, as I read that and studied on it and prayed over it, I, I wondered, is the man accusing the disciples or is he only explaining the situation? I don't know. I do know he's desperate and he's, he's probably disappointed, don't you think? But either way, he's, he's a helpless father and he's asking for help in the only way he knows. Folks, have you ever been in a situation where all you can do is cry out in the only way you know. Have you ever thought about the fact that that's not the time for fancy prayers? That's not the time for big thoughts. That's not the time for quoting Bible verses even. That's the time for tears and it's a time for, for crying out and saying, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I need some help. Say amen if you've ever been there. Amen. I believe just about every one of us, probably all of us, have been there. Well, Jesus doesn't blame the disciples. He knows their failure is not unique to them. Simple truth is, every one of us is just like them. We have no power of our own. We can't do something on our own strength. Mark chapter 9, verse 19. He, Jesus, answered him, the father of the boy, and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? And then he says, bring him to me. I'm going to pause a minute there. I am so grateful. I am so thankful that Jesus Christ said about me, bring him to me. I expect every one of us here has been busted flat on our face, maybe even are right now. 
And Jesus Christ is saying, bring him to me. Bring her to me. Can you have a little bit of faith that that's true? Well, those of us on the outside of the crowd looking on have an advantage. When Jesus says, how long shall I be with you? He isn't angry. He understands. He's just laying out the truth. The truth is Satan hates this young man. Satan's using him to stir up a big old argument. He's using him to distract people away from Jesus Christ. Do you fall for that? I bet you have. I know I have. Satan's good at it. Maybe next week I'll tell you about old Scratch. Old Scratch is good at getting into where he doesn't belong. Now don't forget the crowd is in a disagreement with the scribes and that's exactly what Satan wants because then the attention is off Jesus. I figure it went kind of like this. The scribes are saying something along the line of to the disciples and to the crowd, See, you bunch of fools. We told you that Jesus and his followers are all fake. From now on, look to us for the answers. We'll tell you what's what. We've been telling you to do that your whole life. What are you doing out here looking at this fake, false preacher? The devil Old Satan, he's right at their side. And I think he's whispering, that's it. That's it, scribes, pour it on. Cover them up. Destroy their faith. Let these people have it with both barrels. And Jesus goes straight to the center of the problem. He'll do that in our life, too. He doesn't care about the scribes. This isn't about them. They're not important. This isn't even about the father or his son. And it isn't about Satan either. You see, Satan has no power over Jesus Christ. And if you give Jesus Christ power over your life, then Satan has no power over your life either, unless you let him. So what is this about? Why is this in the book? This is about Jesus seeing a crowd of folks who need to be told how to have enough faith to look to God for help. And as only Jesus can do, he's going to show them how to find that faith with a miracle. Now, remember, when the situation began, Jesus wasn't there. He walks up to the crowd. You have the crowd, the desperate father, and his stricken son, and the disciples are there, and the religious leaders who Jesus called sons of Satan another time are there too. They're up to no good. From where we stand... We see them face to face with the disciples, the men who follow Jesus. They've been down a lot of trails together by now. They've slept out in the cold together on the side of the trail by now. They've been hungry. They've sacrificed. They've left everything at home to go follow the teacher. And these scribes are no doubt sneering and mocking these men. These men are still learning too. These men are different than the men who we see in the Bible after Jesus is resurrected and he ascends back to heaven. These men are more timid. You can hear those scribes saying, if Jesus is such a great holy teacher, then you ought to be able to chase this demon away. While well, you've been with Jesus day and night, you should have learned something by now. Go on ahead. Show us what he's taught you. 
Has Satan ever used somebody to talk to you that way about your faith? Show me this Jesus you talk about. I'm going to get off on a little sidetrack, but it won't be very far. Folks, every one of us goes to Jesus Christ with a tiny bit of faith if we go at all. And we have to have that much to begin so that he can show us in our life miracle after miracle after miracle. I'm not talking about somebody who can't walk, suddenly can or anything. I'm talking about everyday living when things happen that you cannot imagine ever could have happened. I wasn't going to say this, but I guess I will. Wednesday night, <clears throat> I was feeling pretty low. I won't go into why, but I was hurting. Wednesday night's Bible study night around here. And I was hurting, emotionally hurting. And a fella <laughs> walked in and he said, could I testify tonight? Not something we normally do in our Bible study time. And I believe God said to me, you need to let him say a word. And I said, sure. And that fellow stood up. And with tears in his eyes, he talked about the value of this church. When I needed to hear God has got his hand on us, and no matter what else is happening, he's got us. He's going to take care of us. I desperately needed to hear that. And God, oh, God sent a man to say it when I was most desperately in need of it. Those are the miracles that will build our faith. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So these disciples, no doubt, uh, when they were challenged, they were probably a little too proud to say, well, we only follow Jesus. We can't begin to do what he does. So they decided to give it a shot. And I don't blame them. I might have done the same thing. I don't know. They've seen Jesus cast out demons. They've seen Jesus heal people. Maybe they said some of the words that he said. They may have thought if they said the right thing in just the right way, then the demon would have to come out. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you that's magic. That's wrong. We don't have to do an incantation of some kind when we pray. Pray deep from inside yourself, will you? I often have short, little, simple conversations with Jesus Christ. If I see a pretty sunset, I'll, I might even say, as a sure a pretty picture you painted tonight. Thank you. And I think he hears those words every bit as much, probably more, than those big old long-winded sermons and prayers. If you don't realize it, that kind of stuff is still with us today, not the stuff I just mentioned about me, but that nonsense about what we're supposed to do in such a way and follow some man who claims that he knows how to do it. You don't believe me, turn on the religious channels for about that long, not very long. You don't need your head corrupted. You're going to see Satan-led preachers who claim to be religious leaders and they'll volunteer as long as you're willing to pay the price. If you're new around here, you'll notice we didn't pass a plate. You don't pay a price here. You do what you can, and the good Lord will provide. Well, times and cultures change, but Satan uses the same old lies. 
He's not smart enough to be original. I have no respect for his intellect. Why does he use the same old lies? Like I said, I don't think he knows how to create anymore, invent them. But he also uses them because those same old lies still work. Because humanity doesn't change and we're all generation after generation pretty much the same. We're the same as that first century crowd. And did you notice Jesus didn't scold his disciples? Why? Did they do what they shouldn't have done? I imagine they did. It wasn't their place to do what they tried to do. But they didn't take a trip to the woodshed because their failure is not what matters. Our failure doesn't matter either unless we're determined to keep failing. At some point, we have to say enough. When Jesus said, how long shall I be with you? He wasn't saying he wants to be done and gone. He's asking, how long shall I be with you? I think he's asking, how long shall I be with you before you finally learn to have some faith in God? And did you notice Jesus doesn't bother to even speak to the scribes? They're not important. I expect he knows they're never going to have faith. If you're here today, I'm going to tell you Jesus Christ brought you through the door. Because he loves you that much and he brought you here for his own purpose. Maybe you're here to tell somebody something they need to hear. Maybe you're here to hear something that God will have somebody tell you. But you're here because he brought you here. So what's the important thing on that day? Jesus said, how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Mark chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. Then they brought him, the boy, to him, Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, the boy, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he, Jesus, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Well, Jesus knows how long it's been happening to him. He wants you and me and everybody else to know how long it's been happening. This event is all about faith. It's not about impressing God with our behavior. If we're not wise, we'll fall into the same trap as the disciples did. We don't want to ever be full of ourselves. Do you understand that? If God uses us, we ought to be so doggone grateful. And we ought to know we got used not because we're so useful, but because he loves us enough to make use of even us. This is your preacher talking to you. I know who I am. And prayer is not a magic formula to make things go our way. Genuine, true heart fair, prayer is necessary in a Jesus Christ-led life. We ought to be talking to him often. But if we're not careful, our prayers ending in Jesus' name can be come some sort of a magic phrase. Something we just say out of habit. Kind of like an incantation. If you don't know that word, go look it up. It simply means repeat again and again and again the same things over and over and over. And expecting that somehow God will hear us. Jesus Christ said of the scribes and the Pharisees, by their much speaking, they think they will be heard because they love to say these big old long sermons and prayers. So, if we fall into that trap, 
we might decide we just need to pray more or louder or with fancier words. And when that doesn't work, well then maybe we'll decide that we have too much sin in our lives so God won't answer us so we try to live better. as if our behavior is some sort of a magical bribe. I'm kind of preaching, aren't I? Something for us to all think about, though. We can't bribe God to place Him in our debt. And when even that doesn't work, we might decide, well, maybe we're missing this, the special technique. So we go buy us a book all about prayer and how to pray. And when none of that works, then sometimes, tragically, folks become like the scribes. Christianity's in trouble these days. Christianity's losing folks. Churches are shrinking. Churches are closing. And it's because they have turned from the simplicity of the good news message. What's the good news message? Jesus Christ came to this world. We just celebrated the idea of his birth, a simple, innocent, little infant, helpless, entirely helpless. The Bible says he grew and waxed strong in the spirit. So he somehow, even Jesus learned until at the age of 12, he amazes people in, in, who should know everything in the temple. And he's ama they're amazed at what he can tell them. And he walks through all the misery we ever walked. You can see that in Hebrews. I wish we had, if we were doing a class, we'd be tearing all that apart. I wish we had time. He walked through all of that mess so that we can look at him and say, oh, he understands. He knows who we are. He knows our miseries. And then when the time was right and the job was done, he was arrested, tortured, placed on a cross. suffered for six miserable hours and finally cried out, it is finished. What was finished? Not his life. What was finished is his amazing work that he did for the likes of me. I still can't wrap my head around that. And I've been around that story for, where am I now? I guess, um, 25 years almost. I'm a slow learner. It took me a while. But I got there. <laughs> Maybe you're a slow learner too. It is finished. And he was saying, I've done what I came to do. I've been the perfect sacrifice. Without any blemish at all, I have done it. Will you accept what I did and give me your sin? I paid for it. He says, give it to me. It's mine now. Well, when the boy fell down in front of Jesus, Jesus said, Mark chapter 9, verses 21 to 24, so you know where we are. So Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said from childhood, often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, 
This is the heart of the message. By the way, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, if you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I'm almost in tears myself. I remember saying that to Jesus Christ. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Have you said that to God? Help my unbelief. His father's desperate. He loves his boy. And he knows he's before God. Can you see him there? Can you imagine you're on the edge of the crowd watching all this happen? There he is, a humble, broken-hearted man. Tears are running from his eyes. We men aren't supposed to cry. That's a bunch of nonsense, by the way. Big men cry. Tears running down his face. And he's begging for faith. And so there's the heart of what I believe Jesus Christ told me today to say to you. Will you, will I place ourselves at the cross? Will the day come? Has it come? Will we cry out to Jesus? All we need is just enough faith to say, I've come to you. I've come to you, Jesus. I believe. Help my unbelief. I need so much more belief. Lord God, will you help my unbelief? Mark chapter 9, verses 25 to 29. When Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I'm going to stop right there for just a moment, if you bear with me. Every one of humanity who ever comes to Jesus Christ and calls out, I believe, help my unbelief, is dead. Spiritually dead until Jesus Christ takes them by the hand and lifts them up. Do you believe what I'm saying? I don't care if you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for 70 years or, or 10 minutes. You all, including me, begin in the same place. You can't study your way into heaven. You can't do anything except say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And if you're wise... If I'm wise, I'll say that over and over and over again through my life. Because none of us is ever going to get this exactly right from that day forward. Not until we step into the presence of Jesus Christ in heaven. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I think when Jesus said of the demon, this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting, he was saying only God can do it. 
Only God's going to be able to do it. Your part is just have enough faith to ask and then turn it over to God. So every one of us is in that situation day by day, probably. I admire you if you don't ever have something each day in your life when you're saying, I have no idea how to solve this one. And you turn it over to God if you're wise. The demons obey him. The demons don't obey disciples. They don't obey you. They don't obey me. Our life's misery and messes don't obey us either. You see, Jesus is in charge. If we can have just a little bit of faith, a little bit of belief, he'll take charge. Jesus has great compassion and love. This boy and his father, well, tell you the truth, they're pathetic sinners just like me. Oh, you too. I'm not going to leave you out. Don't you feel included now? This man and his afflicted son, they have no right to mercy. We have no right to mercy either. That's kind of hard for us to wrap our head around this, but you see, we have trouble accepting that only a little faith is enough because we think we have to prove something. We think that Jesus will heal us of selfish pride one of the seven deadly sins. And the simple truth is pride is what drives humanity to stupid, sinful decisions. I want to do what I want to do. Why? Because I want to do it. And on and on we go. I'm going to tell you just a couple of quick things about repentance. We use that word a lot in church. People love to throw it around. Almost never gets defined. Repentance is simple. Look at what is not working. This is a voice of experience, by the way. I've done a lot of repenting in my life and I still have to a lot. Look at what's not working in your life. If you decide you're done with it, Begin to change the way you think. Think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what the payoff is. Is it worth the misery that it's bringing? And at that point, just say to yourself, I guess maybe I'll keep thinking about this and, and I'll ask for some help getting over it. And you can put away pornography, you can put away booze, you can put away drugs, you can put away a lot of things and God's bigger than all of it. But we have to have a little bit of belief. So it's hard for us to accept that because we want to be self-sufficient, I guess. My suggestion as we finish up is we ought to take these words of Christ and place them deeply into our lives. All things are possible to one who believes. All things are possible. He didn't say a few things. He didn't say now and again something's possible. He said all things are possible to one who believes. If it's a righteous desire and it's the right thing and it works with what God wants done, it is possible, but sometimes he expects us to ask. The man could have stayed home with his boy, couldn't he? Instead, he brought him out there on the hill. Now remember this, though, folks. Faith isn't a guarantee that we can ask and will receive. Because God's ways are not our ways, and he understands things we can't even begin to imagine. Jesus is in charge. He knows what's best for us. Looking back on my life, I can see so many times that 
Now I say thank God for unanswered prayers. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, you're an honor sponge. I love you for that. <laughs> thank God for unanswered prayers. Because there's so many things I don't know. And he knows everything. Speaking of praying, that's what we're going to do. I hope you're praying for, for Cash Cowboy Church and Darren up there. It's a big old job he's got. It's a tough place. Not an easy place to be. So let's go to the Lord, shall we? No, Lord, we want to thank you. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Take us by the hand and, and lead us on, Lord. Now, we're going to just tell you right up front something y'all y'all know. Uh, amongst us our, ourselves, we know it. You certainly know it. We're not very good followers. We're pretty clumsy. Lord, we're going to tell you we're sometimes right off the trail. We're not mindful we ride right over a cliff. So Lord, would you, would you guard us, help us, protect us, be with our church. Let this be a place of love, a place of unity, a place where folks feel safe to be who they are. Thank you so much, Lord, for the snow that's come this year and the necessities of our lives. Praying for Bob, who's home today, had his knee replaced, other needs among ourselves. We pray for our nation. We pray for our military scattered all over the world. There's just so many needs, Lord, that we can present before you. And most of all, we pray, Lord, that we might grow closer and closer to you. Lord, help our unbelief. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. What did I do? Hey, Bubba. How are you? <laughs> He's working that too, brother. Wow. <clears throat> God gave it to me. Thank him too. <laughs> Love you, brother. Y'all have ever been a, on a camping trip and slept out under the stars and woke up in the morning to a sunshine, maybe a bird flying overhead, and you just say to yourself, Wow, thank you, Lord. This is sure a pretty scene you've made for me. You know, a lot of people do that, and they're just so blessed to wake up and see that sunshine, that sunrise, and the start of a brand new day that the Lord has given them. I'm going to sing a song about that right now. And it's, uh, the name of the song is God Made a Cowboy. And... Uh, you can stand and sing along if you like. If you don't know the words, just read them out. You may not know the words, but you'll get to them. You'll get them real quick, and we invite you to sing along if you'd like. Sleeping in the moonlight 
everybody's walk with Jesus is it going okay for you sir yes sir <laughs> yeah I hear a few, few weak yeahs walking with Jesus is uh, <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do but it's worth it you know and uh, we just hope you all feel that same way and uh Sing along with this next song that we're going to do for you. One, two, three, four.
Just a closer walk. Thank you for clapping for Jesus. That's great. <laughs> you can be seated. Uh, I don't know about the announcements. The, I don't know if they're scrolling or not, but uh, we've got men and women's Bible study on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock dinner and Bible study shortly thereafter. And then every Friday at uh, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, sorry, not 6. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's even too early for me. Uh, men's breakfast and Bible study, that's been going pretty good here lately. We had, we had a uh, guest teacher last week, he did really good too. And uh, Bible studies for the women, I guess that's to be announced at a later date as far as what the dates are going to be. It's also going to be on the website. And on our website. We got one of those. I ought to know. I, I put the I put everything on there. I should ought to know that, shouldn't I? I have OGB. You know what that is? Old guy brain. It's called memory loss. <laughs> but anyway, right now we're going to have uh, uh, all these chairs are going to be picked up soon, uh, right after us. We say grace, and piled up over yonder, and then bring out the tables for. Uh, dinner this afternoon, and uh, everybody's going to have to just get home safe after that. They're going to have a full belly if you stick around, that's for sure. Let's all pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for the folks that are here today. Thank you for the any new folks that you may have brought in. Uh, you brought them in through the door, and I hope they come back for more, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the food that we are about to eat. Thank you for the folks that prepared it and brought it in here for us to enjoy and fellowship with. Thank you, God, for everything you do in our lives throughout the week. And please be with each and every one of us as we go about our business uh, serving you this week, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this church and this church body that you have brought in here. In Jesus' name, amen. Go! <laughs> Not home.